National Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. L'audience du Tribunal Penal International pour l'ex Yugoslavia est ouverte. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody, and to you, Madam Registrar, if you could call the case, please. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, everyone in the courtroom. This is case ITO 588T, the prosecutor versus Vojadin Popovic L. Thank you. For the record, all the accused are here. Um, amongst the defense teams, I noticed the absence of uh, Mr. Stoic. And is Mr. Sarapa here or not? No. No. Uh, he is absent too. But Mr. Petrosic is here. Prosecution is Mr. McCloskey, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Van der Puy. All right. Um, uh, so, welcome back. We, we do have a lot of issues that we could uh, raise, but uh, we have every intention to proceed uh, with as much celerity as possible and, if necessary, break uh, these down into uh, um, uh, parts. Uh, today we'll deal with those which are uh, more urgent and more relevant to uh, this and the next couple of sittings. Um, uh, uh, may we uh, remind you, uh, with uh, some emphasis, uh, to your obligations pursuant to our order concerning the presentation of evidence and the conduct of parties uh, during the defense cases, which we issued on the 26th of uh, May. Uh, pursuant to paragraph 3A of that order, um, uh, Within uh, seven days of the provision of the list of witnesses for June by the Popovic uh, team, the prosecution and the remaining defense teams were obliged to provide an estimate of the total time expected to be taken cross-examining each witness. Now, uh, it seems that uh, not everyone uh, has grasped uh, the uh, idea and also the procedure that needs to be followed. Some of you have uh, sent an email uh, to the uh, uh, senior legal officer. Uh, prosecution uh, provided um, a provisional uh, time estimate for cross-examination. Uh, others have just informed uh, the uh, uh, senior legal officer without an indication of even whether the prosecution ha was being informed and um, uh, and uh, Mr. Zivanovic was being informed. So uh, we would like you please to follow the following procedure. Uh, your position needs to be communicated formally by means, by means of a filing. That's how we would like you to uh, do it. Uh, the end of the day between sending an email to the senior legal officer and uh, making a proper filing, there isn't much uh, difference. But um, uh, we, it would enable us to make sure that everyone is properly informed. Uh, again, uh, uh, paragraph 3B of the order states that by 5 p.m. on Friday of each week uh, during the defense case, the prosecution and the remaining defense team shall provide the trial chamber and other parties with an estimate of the total time expected to be taken cross-examining each witness. Now, the prosecution filed a notice in time, giving its estimate, and the Nikolic and uh, Militic time teams sent emails. Uh, Um, uh, Borovchanin and Gvero uh, filed theirs on Sunday, 
which was beyond the uh, time limit, please, again, we are not, we don't intend to make a mountain out of, uh, out, out of this uh, molehill, but please stick to the uh, time frames that we have uh, ind indicated, uh, and uh, uh, if possible, uh, use uh, the uh, uh, form of uh, filing. Um, uh, Uh, there is uh, move on to uh, a motion uh, from Mr. Jovanovic, uh, which I will refer to uh, as uh, the Popovic defense team reunited to uh, this uh, motion. Um, uh, we are going to uh, rule uh, on this orally now. Um, uh, on the 19th of May 2008, uh, the Popovich defense team filed a confidential motion for admission of evidence pursuant to Rule 92 bis, in which um, uh, he proposed to uh, uh, admit the statements of six witnesses without cross-examination. That motion appears to have been modified according to the trial chamber by uh, Mr. Jovanovic's uh, subsequent filing of a notice concerning the witness's schedule and the estimated uh, time for the, for the examination on the 23rd of uh, May 2008. In the notice, uh, the Popovich defense team uh, notes that one of the six witnesses, uh, with Danilovic, uh, Dan Oilovich, Dan Oilovich, will testify as a viva voce witness for Pandurovic. Popovic also states that he will move to convert another of the witnesses, that is uh, Vukicevic, uh, to a viva voce status based upon the prosecution's initial opposition. The Popovic defense team also appears to indicate that uh, he will call another of these witnesses, that is witness Ilic, for viva voce testimony. In its response, uh, which was filed on the 28th of May 2008, the prosecution uh, did not oppose the admission of any of the six uh, statements. It does, however, note that it wishes to cross-examine both Ilic and Danoilovic, and that it does not wish to cross-examine uh, witness Vukicevic. The trial chamber construes the uh, Popovic defense team motion and uh, uh, his subsequent uh, notice as withdrawing his Rule 92 bis requests to admit the statements of witnesses Danoilovic and Ilic. As to the remaining four witnesses at issue in the motion, the prosecution does not oppose the admission of their statements and does not seek to cross-examine any of them. The trial chamber has reviewed the statements and has determined that each is appropriate for admission without cross-examination pursuant to Rule 92 uh, bis. Accordingly, the statements of witnesses Vukicevic, Yusufovic, Maji Brada, and Vaisaf uh, Laevich are provisionally admitted without cross-examination pending their receipt uh, in a form that fully complies with the requirement of Rule 92 uh, bis, uh, subparagraph B. Is that clear to you, Mr. Jovanovic? You need to follow this formality before they can actually be admitted. Yes, it is. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, uh, we have uh, cleared that as well. Um, uh, now, uh, there was uh, M Mr. Haynes and Mr. Uh, McCloskey um, uh, uh, accused Pandurovic filed a motion on the 26th of May 2008 uh, to amend uh, his uh, 65 tier list by adding one document. Uh, then, subsequently, three days later, on the 29th of May, um, uh, Popovich's uh, defense team filed a similar uh, motion, 
uh, namely to amend the, its, uh, his Rule 65 to exhibit list with five exhibits pertaining to uh, witness that I'm not going to uh, mention uh, here. Uh, my understanding and the information that the trial chamber has received, uh, based on the information that the trial chamber has received, is that the opposition does not oppose uh, these two uh, motions. I just want a confirmation of that, following which we'll uh, uh, proceed with granting the two motions. That's correct, Mr. President. Okay, I thank you, uh, and I asked you for the record, not because I wanted to verify. Um, uh, uh, having heard you, Mr. McCloskey, uh, we uh, grant uh, both uh, motions, um, uh, considering that they are justified and no opposition is forthcoming from the prosecution. Now, when we had the um, uh, pre-defense uh, conference, uh, you will recall that we had uh, discussed at some length um, uh, problem, uh, an issue pending between Mr. Uh, Mac, between the prosecution and the Popovich defense team about uh, whether the Popovich defense team had uh, provided the prosecution with uh, proper, adequate 65 uh, witness summaries. I am informed, uh, and again, you will uh, need to confirm this to me, that uh, an agreement has been reached and uh, that the prosecution has no further reason uh, to um, uh, uphold uh, or continue with uh, their objection or with their representation uh, to the trial chamber. Is that correct, Mr. McCloskey? Yes, Mr. Pre we have no further objection. And uh, I am assuming then that you are going to uh, formally withdraw this uh, motion. You can withdraw it orally here if you uh, want to. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I withdraw that okay. at this time. Thank you. Um, I think we have covered what is uh, what was more urgent for the purpose of uh, this uh, sitting. Um, uh, I will soon be proceeding uh, with the admission of uh, the first uh, witness, but I take it, Mr. Uh, Zivanovic, that you want to address uh, the chamber before that. And I also see one moment because uh, Ms. Favreau is quicker than uh, both of us. Yes, Madame Favreau. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I would just like to tell you that I informed my colleague, Mr. Zhivanovich, that I had um, a very brief intervention before he starts. I would like to talk about the order regarding the the order of the cross-examination. So I would like to ask you, before the first witness begins to testify, I would like you to clarify a point in this order. According to the order, the parties who have already cross-examined a witness may have a redirect when a new topic uh, is raised during the examination in chief led by the prosecutor. The clarification that I would like to ask you to make is the following. The defense, after the examination in chief, if the defense says that they have no questions, and if during the cross-examination of the prosecutor a particular uh, issue um, is um, uh, arises, uh, would the defense have the right to put additional questions after the cross-examination of the prosecutor, even if they had not cross-examined previously the witness?
Uh, we are not going to provide you with a uh, general uh, rule applicable uh, uh, throughout the entire trial. Uh, we'll entertain uh, such requests uh, even when they arise and they will be decided on uh, whether it's in the interest of justice uh, to uh, grant or not to grant. That's the position we'll take. So, um, uh, Mr. Jovanovic, uh, you asked uh, some uh, weeks ago uh, to, uh, for an opportunity to uh, make an opening uh, statement, uh, which uh, you have uh, now. Um, uh, please uh, go ahead. After that, we'll uh, bring your first uh, witness. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. <coughs> uh, good morning, Your Honours, uh, and the defense team of Vujadin Popovic is in the unique position to begin presentation of its case, uncertain that the prosecution has ended the presentation. Could uh, uh, the counsel please lead, read slower? Such position requires corresponding opening statement. <coughs> In the first place, although we have got the green light to appeal the decision to reopen the prosecution case, I'm going to state in the open court how it badly affected the defense of my client. By doing so, I do not intend to elaborate the factual and the legal arguments, since it will be done in our appeal. But the interest of justice and the right of my client on fair trial compels me to summarize very briefly serious impact on the right of my client to have a fair trial. Five weeks after conclusion of its case, the prosecution asked to ro reopen it on the ground of new evidence on the events unrelated for the acts from the indictment. It was done while the defense was fully engaged in preparation <coughs> of its case. And uh, despite of relevance of such evidence for preparation of our defense, the prosecution decided not to disclose it for whole four weeks. It seriously affected the right of my client on fair trial in two ways. <coughs> First of all, our unawareness misled us not to direct our attention toward new evidence, to, to rearrange our defense strategy and find corresponding evidence. Moreover, the prosecution decided to disclose new evidence, not before our defense submitted military expert report. In the second place, unlike the other defense teams, we had to divide our attention in next three weeks between the preparation of our defense and challenging the motion to reopen the prosecution case. But despite of all mentioned disadvantages, we shall begin this morning the presentation of our evidence. Due to uncertainty as to reopening of the prosecution case, I shall not address in this opening statement acts and conduct of the accused, but only the crime base to the extent that we dispute. But before the listing these issues, I want to state clearly that our defense does not deny that large but still unknown number of Muslim men was executed after the fall of Srebrenica in July 1995. It was apparently a serious crime punishable un under both national and international law. <coughs> However, we strongly deny that such crime 
amounts to genocide. Similarly, we dispute the charge from paragraph 25 of the indictment that VRS and MOOC forces murdered over 7,000 Muslim men and boys. Our submission is that such allegations have been widely and unnecessarily exaggerated to meet one of the requirements for genocide, genocide charge. Therefore, in the course of our case, we shall bring several experts who will challenge the findings of the prosecution, demography, DNA, and forensic expert witnesses. Our defense also denies that Srebrenica ever became a safe area in the true sense of the term. We shall demonstrate that the decent intent of United Nations <coughs> Security Council to protect civilian population from the war sufferings was perverted by decision of B and H authorities to keep there its 6,000 people strong unit. We shall prove that from the onset of the Bosnian War until the very end of the enclave, Srebrenica was the focal point of organized subversive activities against both civilian and military targets on the territory of Republika Srpska. We shall document that B and H authorities forbade Muslim pop civilians to leave the enclave preventing and punishing all those who attempted to do that. We shall prove that it was done both in order to provide cover from potential retribu uh, retribu uh, retribution anticipated after attacks on surrounding Serbian villages and to provide log log logistic by misappropriation of humanitarian aid designated for the civilian population. <coughs> it is our submission that VRS had a full right to neutralize such constant two years long three threat. Consequently, we submit that Operation Krivaya 95 was legitimate military operation against enemy forces undertaken just after all other means for disarming 28th Division were ineffective. We further submit that the movement of Muslim civilians displaced in Potocari and transported to the B and H territory was a result of explicit requests made by civilians and conveyed to General Mladic by Dutch Bat commander. Refusal of such request meant the prohibition to civilians to leave the enclave and would be a serious crime against their freedom of movement. Accordingly, <coughs> I strongly oppose to the language of the indictment describing the acts in Potocari as separation of the Muslim men and boys from their families. We have demonstrated that the ABH soldiers disguised in civilian cloth were mingled among the refugees in Potocari. We shall document that <coughs> VR, VRS had legitimate right <coughs> to isolate and arrest all suspected enemy soldiers and they did it. There is no arrest without, without separation of detained individuals from those who remain free, including their families. The language of the prosecution avoids saying clearly that VRS arrested the Muslim men in Potocari as suspected enemy soldiers being aware of legitimacy of such acts. It, however, charges the, the accused with <coughs> legitimate and unavoidable consequence of such act, the separation of arrested people 
from those who remain free. By stating it, I would like to emphasize that subsequent maltreatments, abuses, and executions of detainees were completely illegal acts, punishable both under national and international law. But their detention was legal. Our defense will also prove that all Muslim men in Srebrenica from 16 to uh, 65 years of age were eligible and mobilized into armed forces according to the B and H laws. We shall argue that they left Srebrenica on 11 July 1995 to Jaglici and Šušnjari, complying with the orders of competent Srebrenica authorities. In support of this submission, I show the inspection of the brigade from the 8th op <coughs> operative group carried out on the second anniversary of the ABH in May 1994. This video depicts the unarmed Muslim man, all in civilian cloth, arrayed in the various brigade of the 8th operation group of ABH. The video was obtained in the course of our investigation from the association of the former camp inmates of Republika Srpska. It has not been translated yet. Uh, is there anything wrong? Uh, I see, okay. Uh, do, do you want to proceed with this? Because uh, I think it makes very little sense uh, going through it as it is. Uh, yes, uh, we have the problem uh, with sound. Uh, but uh, the video depicts um, uh, those brigades consisting just of uh, uh, men in civilian cloth right, uh, arrayed you, you and presented as uh, various brigade members. Right. You will be producing this uh, in due course? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, however, despite of military character of the column breaking through the territory held by VRS, it was not attacked while past the first line of Srebrenica encirclement. At the time, it clearly demonstrated the absence of an intent on the part of VRS to kill all the Muslim men from the column and specific intent to commit genocide. In corroboration of this submission, you will see the statement of B&H Prime Minister Hassan Muratovic in his speech on the session of the B&H Parliament held in August 1995, discussing the causes of the fall of Srebrenica and Japa. The whole session was recorded on two CDs, and I would ask to play it. I'm afraid we have, again, the problem with sounds. Yeah. 
excuse me, may we, may we have a very short break for two or three minutes to, to, to resolve this uh, sound problem? So, yes. Of course. Thank of you course. very much, Your Honor. Night after night, television brought images of death and suffering from the war that engulfed Yugoslavia between the several smaller states. In supporting Croatian separatists is confirmed by Anton Duhacek, the former director of...
ready to go? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, I will go back to, to the uh, inspection of the 28 division units. Uh, Interpreter's note, since the audio is too poor to interpret from, we are merely reading out the BCS transcript provided by the defense. The material strengthening of the military forces, the successful fulfillment of tasks and functional duties in the war units, as well as exceptional results uh, achieved by the war units, uh, it all reflected upon the strengthening of the morale. Uh, as regards the second anniversary of the formation of the staff of the armed forces of Srebrenica, uh, which is now the command of the 8th Operational Group of Srebrenica as part of the 2nd Corps of the Army of uh, the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, I, I commend the following soldiers. <laughs> The command of the 283rd Light Brigade, ready for inspection. Commander Halilovic Huso reporting. You can stop here. Thank you. Uh, I just like to let the tri chamber know that we provided the translation booth with the uh, BCS text of these video clips. Uh, it was uh, <coughs> the inspection of uh, 282 brigade. We have uh, the similar <coughs> uh, similar uh, similar clips. Uh, uh, but we will not show it uh, to say the court time uh, of the other brigades uh, from the 28th Division. Uh, <coughs> I hope we will be able to do that through testimony of our investigator, Mr. Perl Mijatovic. <coughs> uh, the next video clip is. Uh, uh, the statement of B&H Prime Minister Hassan Muratovic in his speech on the session of B&H Parliament held in August 1995 discussing the causes of the fall of Srebrenica and Zepa. <coughs> Interpreters note the same situation applies to this clip. Mr. Hassan Muratovic, Prime Minister, would like to speak. Dear Mr. Chairman, MPs, ladies and gentlemen, let me briefly summarize a few things. We have identified Mr. Muratovic, and now I would ask to play uh, the same video from uh, 20, uh, 21 minutes 47 seconds. <coughs> The interpreters were not provided with this part of the footage, and the audio is too poor to decipher the speech itself. There is a question that should be clarified. Whether Mr. Akashi had an agreement with Mladic that people from Srebrenica should leave for Tuzla and that he would let them pass through, that needs to be explored. It was carried by the Western press on several occasions, and there were some theories coming from UN representatives that the people from Srebrenica should be let to pass peacefully through to Tuzla, 
Therefore, there are great chances that such an agreement existed with some people from Srebrenica I tried to talk about whether they had been told about such a possibility since there is a fact in existence and that is that our, uh, it, our people were not shot at while they were coming out of the first encirclement of Srebrenica Pratovic, however, corrupt corroborated another submission of our defense regarding intercept evidence. I would ask uh, to play the same video from a 16 minute um, five seconds. Our army possesses a lot of audio tapes, tapes with executions on them, and about orders that the groups breaking through to Tuzla should be killed. We also have an intercept in which backhoe loaders and excavators were requested to dig mass graves. Thank you. Uh, this statement clearly corroborates our submission that B and H authorities are in possession of contemporaneous audio records of the intercept conversations. However, they refused to hand over such materials to this tribunal to avoid undermining of authenticity, reliability, and probative value of intercepts adduced in this and previous Srebrenica-related cases. We have challenged many conclusions by the prosecution's military expert, <coughs> expert uh, Richard Butler. Through a number of witnesses, exhibits, and testimony of our military and, uh, and testimony of our military expert, we shall prove his erroneous interpretation of evidence related to the Srebrenica events in July 1995. Finally. We found that the background of the Srebrenica events in July 1995 is incomplete and misinterpreted. The first instance of such misinterpretation is six strategic objectives of the Serbian people in B and H. We shall prove that it was nothing more than the plane made by European Union and its representative Portugal diplomat Coutilheiro generously conceived to prevent the war in Bosnia. We shall prove that those objectives were not criminal but incorporated in Dayton Peace Agreement, document by which the war in Bosnia was ended. It will be clarified through our first witness, Mr. Momchilo Krajnik. <coughs> I'm aware that the background of the acts charged in the uh, indictment is not the main subject of this case. However, such information is very significant for comprehensive assessment of the events from the, from the indictment. Because of that, it requires <laughs> short but fair presentation of relevant background information. Accordingly, we shall address this issue as briefly as possible, not going into unnecessary analysis, polemics, and details. I decided to present our view on the matters through short video clips from a number of DVDs from our exhibit list. I will not present this morning all this video in their entirety in order to save the court time. However, all this video will be tendered into evidence. In presentation of the background, I submit that causes of the war in Bosnia could not be neglected. This complex and sensitive issue is summarized in the best way in the following clips from our exhibit from video, The War Which Could Be Avoided. The film was divided in 32 chapters 
each of them depicting the stages of war in former Yugoslavia. It explores the causes of war, the responsibility of main actors, and contains the statements of many diplomats, politicians, journalists, <coughs> and military officers from United States, United <coughs> Kingdom, Germany, and former Yugoslavia. All details on authors of the film could be seen at the end of any chapter. Uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, uh, just informed that the clips are not the same when uh, presented at this video from this place, so I'm afraid we'll not be able to show them right now. If the trial chamber let us, uh, we shall do, it, do that after, after some break, after break. Do you wish to have a break now? Yes, words, yes, yes. Your Honor. Okay, you. with you. Um, uh, we, we have a logistical problem uh, in that we had planned other things uh, precisely to coincide with the break uh, taking place at 10.30, uh, which we can't move now because it's too late. Uh, so we have a commitment at, eight, at 10.30. How much time do you require to fix this thing? I hope 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. We'll have a 10 to 15 minutes uh, now so that you fix it, then we'll continue, uh, stop at 10.30, um, uh, and then try to recover as much ground as we can as we go along. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All rise. Veuillez vous lever. All rise. Veuillez vous lever. Please be seated. Mr. Zivanovic, have you sorted out your technical uh, problems? Yes, uh, I resolved. Thank it. you. And I apologize to the oh, chamber. So you don't need the, the you don't need to apologize. These things yes. happen, unfortunately. Uh, yes, I uh, recognize Mr. Nichols. Uh, morning, Your Honor. Sorry to interrupt. Just I noticed Mr. Haynes isn't here. I didn't know if Your Honor would notice that. Yes, uh, Mr. Haynes is absent, and in the meantime, I also wanted to put on record that uh, during the first part of uh, the session, um, Mr. Mitchell, Christopher Mitchell, uh, also uh, for the prosecution, also turned up. So, uh, let's uh, proceed. Because Mr. Sarapa is absent too today, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, um, Mr. Pandurovic, uh, we have a problem. Uh, do you uh, insist on your clients uh, on on your lawyer's uh, presence? No, sir. Let's uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Zivanovic. <coughs> Uh, the video clips 
we shall see right now, summarize our view on the background of Srebrenica event from the indi indi indictment. The first of it is the video of the war which could be avoided. Uh, uh, we can play this video from 13 minutes, five seconds. Uh, the clip we, sh uh, we shall uh, see uh, right now presents the statements of the prominent British journalist, late Miss Nora Baroff, and the former U.S. Secretary of State, James ba Baker. the West should have recognized that until there was an agreed arrangement for a dissolution of a state which had been Yugoslavia and which might take years or decades or perhaps be impossible. Until then, it had to be recognized these were the internationally recognized branches. If German and Austrian leaders still believed that Slovenia and Croatia could be separated from Yugoslavia without a wider war, the Americans strongly believed otherwise. Because we said, if Yugoslavia does not break up peacefully, there's going to be one hell of a civil war. Uh, it nevertheless broke up uh, non-peacefully. It broke up through the unilateral declaration of independence by Slovenia and Croatia, and the seizing by these two countries, uh, republics, of their border posts, which was an act of force, and which was an act that was in violation of the Helsinki uh, principles. Uh, but the European powers and the United States ultimately recognized Slovenia and then Croatia and then Bosnia as independent countries as member and, and admitted them to the United Nations. The real problem was that there was a unilateral declaration of independence and a use of force to gain that independence rather than a peaceful uh, negotiation of independence, which is the way it should have happened. We can stop here. <coughs> And uh, we can move to 47, 16 seconds. Uh, it depicts uh, the statements the, of the British diplomat, uh, Lord Carrington, who was also involved in search for political solution of the Yugoslav crisis. It was crisis. precisely that that led to the current war. This was a war that European leaders believed could have been avoided. The Bosnian Serbs, un until comparatively recently, had been in the majority in Bosnia. And then the Muslims, who had a very much higher birth rate than the Serbs, became the predominant, uh, uh, the, the majority of the population. And this, of course, was something very hard for the Serbs to, uh, to swallow. And uh, they made it abundantly plain very early on that they were not prepared to accept a situation in which there was an independent Bosnia under the constitution which then prevailed. And indeed, under the constitution which then prevailed, uh, it, was not, it was illegal for Izid Begovic to declare independence because any constitutional change of that magnitude had to be agreed by all three parties. Privately. We can stop here. Uh, the next clip from the same film is related to the Kutilieros peace plan for Bosnia. Please play from Your 50 position. minutes, 50 In his book, seconds. The Politics of Diplomacy, then Secretary of State James Baker wrote that Ambassador Zimmerman strongly advised him to recognize Bosnia. Recognition of Bosnia, however, violated the most basic diplomatic norms. For a government to be recognized, it must be in full control of its territory. It must have clearly established borders. It must also have a stable population. Not a single one of these essential conditions existed in Bosnia in February of 1992 when Zimmerman made his recommendation. 
U.S. intelligence analysts predicted that recognition would lead to war. For the record, Mr. Haynes has entered the courtroom. I'd like to say sorry to Even the, the court and to Mr. Zivanovich. I'm Bosnia. very sorry. Yeah, would be a serious mistake. No, it's had we did have some different opinions in early 1992 as the Americans supported the recognition of Bosnia, whereas we, the Europeans, believed that we should first establish a framework for the whole region. So basically the policymakers ignored the analysts and uh, by, by late January, early February, U.S. policy had come around to the view that, that we would recognize Bosnia and we wanted the Europeans to recognize Bosnia along with us. So from, from mid-February on, we were pushing the Europeans hard to recognize Bosnia and, uh, and we were thinking about how we would do that and, and have the U.S. recognize Croatia and Slovenia at the same time. With American support, recognition of a separate Bosnian state was now inevitable. Lord Carrington tried to avert disaster by appointing Portuguese president Josie Cotillero to find common ground among the Serbs, Muslims, and Croats before an independent Bosnia was recognized. I asked him to go to, uh, uh, to Sarajevo and to Lisbon and to have talks about uh, with the three parties in Bosnia to see whether or not some agreement could become, could, could be reached with a unitary uh, state. I mean, a state, an independent Bosnian state, but in some sort of federal idea in which you've got the three communities to agree. The Bosnian Serbs, Croats, and Muslims all signed the pact known as the Lisbon Agreement on March 18, 1992. This set up a central government of Bosnia-Herzegovina and three ethnic cantons on the model of Switzerland. It was the last chance, I think, of trying to preserve uh, Bosnia before the war broke out in, in earnest. If the Lisbon plan had been adopted, British author and BBC journalist Misha Glenny wrote later, the war in Bosnia probably would not have happened. But two days after signing it, following a meeting with American Ambassador Warren Zimmerman, Izetbegovic changed his mind and disavowed his signature. Izetbegovic turned around and, and reneged, uh, as he's reneged on other things. <coughs> Zimmerman later acknowledged to David Binder of the New York Times that Izetbegovic had reluctantly signed the agreement to gain European recognition. More than a year after the bloodshed began in Bosnia, Zimmerman also admitted that the Lisbon plan was not bad at all, but recalls telling Izetbegovic, if you don't like it, why sign it? Zimmerman told Izetbegovic, look, why don't you wait and see what the U.S. can do for you? Meaning, we'll recognize you and then help you out, so don't go ahead with the Lisbon agreement, uh, don't accept the Cutiero plan, and uh, uh, just, just hold out uh, uh, for some kind of unitary Bosnian state. So I, I, this is a, a, a major turning point in, in our diplomatic efforts. The, the American administration made it quite clear that they thought that the proposal, the Cutilera and my proposal, <coughs> were unacceptable. With no agreement amongst the Muslims, Serbs and Croats, and with all sides mobilized for war, the European community voted, as the U.S. insisted, to recognize Bosnia on April 6th, along with Slovenia and Croatia. This act, Roger Cohen of the New York Times later wrote, was as close to criminal negligence as a diplomatic act can be. Indeed, international recognition and the outbreak of the Bosnian War were simultaneous. The world put light to the feud. Thank you. We can stop here. Uh, we shall also challenge the misinterpretation of the event in the spring 1992, when the Bosnian Serb military and paramilitary forces allegedly attacked and occupied cities, towns, and the villages, including Bielin and Zvornik. The prosecution disregarded the re relevant fact that the Serbs in Bosnia held the 70% of B and H land as a legal private property. I play the next clip corroborating this submission. These are well-known Western journalists. Their names could be found in previous sequences of the film. 
I will take it will take less than a minute. Please play one hour, seven minutes, uh, ten seconds. Those to actually trying to create balance of what the Bosnians were doing at the same time. The press would have us believe that the Serbs have seized two-thirds of Bosnia. The fact is the Serbs have lived in that territory for 1,500 years. Uh, the fact is they are farmers and they are spread all over the landscape, so they have always been on two-thirds of the landscape. The statement that has become an absolute cliché that the Serbs have taken over 70% of Bosnia, again, the underlying assumption is that there were no Serbs in Bosnia before the conflict started, when in reality, uh, uh, much of the land of Bosnia was, was Serb land before the fighting ever began. But uh, the implication is that the Serbs dropped in from some other planet and just took over uh, nearly two-thirds of the country. Thank you. And uh, the last clip from this video uh, is the good instance of untrue information with inflated casualties in his, uh, from uh, uh, it is related to another East Bosnian enclave, Gorazde, which was in the area of responsibility of Drina Corp as well. Please play from one hour, 43 minutes, 50 seconds. Control of Western Herzegovina. Two months after the Markala marketplace explosion, the Bosnian government would have its first success in getting NATO to intervene against Bosnian Serb targets near Gorazde. With help from an American military advisor, Muslim forces launched attacks against six Serbian villages around Gorazde. When Serbian forces responded, American television broadcasts portrayed fighting around Gorazde as if it were an unprovoked attack on a safe zone. The Serbs punished Gorazde throughout the day. At one stage, shells were raining down at the rate of one every 20 seconds. Shells are now dropping at random into the city center the hospital has taken direct hits on this roof. There was a dramatic transmission from a ham radio operator supposedly based in Gorazde. <laughs> U.S. President Bill Clinton and Bosnian government Vice President Ejup Danic urged UN Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali to authorize airstrikes against the Bosnian Serbs. NATO airplanes did indeed launch a limited airstrike against Serbian targets. But further airstrikes were called off by Commander Michael Rose, who realized that Muslim forces had manipulated UN agencies with false casualty and damage reports. Instead of 2,000 people injured and 700 people killed, Fewer than 200 people were injured. Instead of the hospital being destroyed, only one shell had passed through the roof. As he flew by helicopter into Gorazde following the fighting, Rose was asked about U.S. satellite reports that nearly every house in Gorazde was damaged. Yes, practically every house in Gorazde has been damaged, but the most of the damage to Gorazde was done in the fighting that had taken place some two years before, when the Bosnian government uh, forces drove the Serbs from this town. And there were 12,500 Serbs at that time living here, and they were all driven off. The, the, the way to distinguish a house that's been damaged by fighting, where a shell has hit it, and a house that's been damaged by ethnic cleansing, is if it's got no roof, no doors, no window frames, and nothing in the house at all, and there are burn marks up it, and bullets spread around the walls. That is, the house that's been damaged by ethnic cleansing, a house that's been damaged by shelling, has a shell hole in it, and there are still people trying to live in that um, building with their furniture, because they've got nowhere else to go. That's something that you can't see from satellites. And of course, at that time, the international image of what had happened in Garazza was very different from the reality. Um, what was dangerous was that policies were beginning to be put together on both sides of the Atlantic uh, about what we should do in Garazza, but these policies were being put together on totally flawed information. According to respected British military analyst Jonathan Ayal, the ham radio operators whose live reports were carried on American television networks were not even based in Gorazde. Thank you. <coughs> However, <coughs> it is my submission <coughs> that most important and a real background of the events from the indictment are atrocities perpetrated by Muslim forces in East Bosnia 
from the very onset of the war in the early spring 1992 until the early July 1995, when the Operation Krivaya was launched. We have gathered 25 videos illustrating the crimes committed in villages around Srebrenica, Bratunets, and Vlasenica <coughs> in order to <coughs> In order to illustrate it, I'll play just a few clips, although we shall tender all of them into evidence to our investigator, Mr. Pero Mirtovic, who provided them from the association of the former camp inmates of Republika Srpska. This material is not translated, so I, I try to select the most relevant parts where the picture speaks everything. Please play. The first one. In addition to all the other civilian casualties, the elderly and the women, two children have also been killed. One was four and the other was nine or ten. They were siblings. What was their names? Dragan Višnić and Dragana, his sister. How old were they? Dragon was four and she was nine. Hold on, hold on, wait. What? My little child, there you go, so that it holds like that. Her whole head is shattered. The second video clip shows the burial in Vlasenica of the victims murdered in late September 1992 in Serska and Podravanya. This video is the second of three CD illustrating the aftermath of the attacks. And the last of uh, video clips uh, uh, is recorded in May 1995, just two months before Operation Krivaya 95 was launched. It depicts the massacre committed during and after attack on Rupovo Brdo on May the 7th, 1995. <laughs>
We can stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honours. Uh, we have finished. Uh, I have finished my opening statement, and defence is now ready to call its first witness, Mr. Momchil Krajnik. Thank you. But I think before that, uh, we'll have the uh, break. Um, uh, Uh, we'll reconvene in 25 minutes' time. Thank you. All rise. Forgive Oliver.